Nothing gives me more hope in the future of our world than meditation. It's not that I always believe this. When I left my career as a Canadian diplomat to become a meditation teacher, my colleagues were shocked. They did not see this coming. <laughs> Neither did I, actually. It's not that meditation itself was new to me. I was fortunate enough to be introduced to the practice by my mom when I was a kid. So running around as a five-year-old, just rambunctiously bumping into coffee tables and practicing cartwheels and getting hurt, she'd remind me to stop, breathe, and just observe sensations in my body. So I would go from tears to ease in a matter of moments. But by my early 20s, I started putting these techniques aside. In fact, I didn't really want to talk about them publicly. I was joining the important world of international relations. I needed to appear pragmatic, normal. <laughs> yeah. So for the next eight years, I focused on my work in the high-powered hallways of international diplomacy. I had a red passport, top-secret security clearance, and I was moving up the ranks really quickly. But you know that feeling you get when you're dating somebody? and they're perfect on paper. And you might even be falling in love, but it's not quite working out. <laughs> that was me with my career. So I turned to meditation to figure it out. I was like, what are all of these complicated emotions that I'm going through here? And along the way, I came across a lot of really interesting research. Science was showing, study after study, that something as simple as pausing to consciously become aware of my breath, notice thoughts, sensation, emotions, let them go, return to the breath. That was having more than just short-term benefits in terms of reduction of stress and a general increase of calm, but it was having long-term benefits in the form of changes to my brain. My brain was actually literally being rewired through meditation. That was enough for me to start a daily meditation practice and get really serious, and from there, I basically turned to teaching and sharing with other people what I was learning. That was about three years ago. And it took me another two years before I started to see the connection between meditation and diplomacy. It started with a hunch that I had, a theory more likely, in terms of how macro, global-level things reflected the amalgamation of micro-level, individual things. So the macro and micro, to me, are very connected, and I see that with global problems as well. Take terrorism, climate change, economic inequality. I see these as expressions of our individual actions at scale. And I'll take it a step further. Those actions are rooted in fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of death, fear of not having enough, fear. Fear whether real or perceived, was not only creating those challenges, but it was also short-circuiting our ability to act in order to change them. Have you ever considered the source of fear? It's right in our brain. That's where meditation comes in. Meditation shrinks the amygdala, the part of the brain responsible for our fear-based fight-or-flight mechanism, and it increases the thickness of our prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain responsible for more advanced functions, things like awareness and compassion in particular, which are actually the fundamental building blocks for transformative change. So this is really incredible. And I got a chance to put my theory to test while I was working with Be More America to co-create a mindfulness-based program to address unconscious racial bias in professional environments. So we launched that pilot just a couple of months ago, and the results are still coming in but I've been very moved by the anecdotal experiences that have been shared with me by the participants in terms of how they're seeing their personal transformations ripple across their lives, with their families, in their workplace, etc. This gives me hope. Backed by science, meditation is making its way into all kinds of unexpected places, everything from colleges to classrooms and corporations, uh, military officials are meditating, Sports teams are meditating. It's even made its way into the British Parliament, where 95 politicians and staff members are meditating together on a regular basis. 
One of my favorite places to teach is the Canadian consulate right in New York. And I was elated to find out just a couple of days ago that meditation has made its way back into headquarters, so the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ottawa. I want to see more of these experiments happening, more possibilities for applying meditation not only to stress reduction and to performance enhancement, but also to global problem solving. So I'd like for you to imagine something with me. What if international organizations like the United Nations, NATO, and the G8 had chief mindfulness officers? Or what if foreign officials meditated together before they entered in negotiation on things like climate change? What if our political leaders in Congress or in Parliament meditated together across party lines before making decisions that were affecting our well-being. I think we'd see a very, very different world. Standing here now, I see us all as diplomats. We all navigate fears on a daily basis. We all work to protect our interests and promote our interests. We're constantly learning and relearning to do this collaboratively. Meditation is the path forward to a better shared reality for all of us. I believe we can get there, one mind at a time. Thank you.